light on if it's helpful. Welcome back, everyone. I'm very glad to uh, have this third uh, day of teaching starting. So whenever Amy is with us, and I'm just going to uh, hand over the mic to you. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, Venable Jim is already translating. I might just say a couple of words in French and then I'll let you take over. So, uh, bienvenue à tous au cas où vous n'ayez pas encore uh, uh, connecté uh, le, la traduction. En fait, vous avez un canal en français où uh, Venerable Jim est en train de traduire. Merci beaucoup, Venerable. Et donc, on a Venerable Amy avec uh, nous et je me réjouis qu'on commence cette uh, troisième journée d'enseignement. Voilà, profitez bien. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm handing the, the floor to you, Venable. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I was also going to just point to um, Arnaud. This picture, so that picture, Arnaud, is from the um, retreat at Garrison, one of the retreats at Garrison. Oh, I see. Okay. I think, um, was his name Michel? Um, yeah. He, he one time just said, can I take a picture and uh, send it to me? And and uh, that was from the garrison when we had the basement, one of the basement rooms, I think one okay. year. I was thinking, those yeah. were such nice retreats. That's true. I enjoyed those. Welcome everyone, welcome back. Happy to see all of you. So I just wanted to check in from yesterday. see am I so I just wonder your thoughts or just any reflections last night any additional questions that have come up we started talking about perspective the first pillar of joy perspective and anything you're you're also thinking of of how um you could have you you know using a, a larger perspective on anything in your life, anything you reflected on last night, and any other questions. Okay, everybody, everybody's good. Great. So let's take a moment. Take a moment, we'll just start with some brief meditation. Just finding a comfortable posture for your body. Having the nice extension for your spine. As Lama Sopa Rinpoche says, as if your sides are long. So that kind of makes this extension from the spine to think of that. You can lightly close your eyes. And allow your respiration to deepen. This is a practice I often start while I'm waking up in bed in the morning. But you can do this any time of the day as it's now your afternoon. Do you have a moment to consider gratitude, which is one of the pillars of joy? One of the pillars of the heart related to the heart, gratitude. So as you inhale, and, and you can reflect on the positive circumstances of your life. There are many.
we have relatively clean air to breathe and clean water to drink. We have food, clothing, shelter, which are luxuries on parts of the planet. We are not living under bombs right now. We've had access to decent public education. We may have loving family and friends. We have the most incredible access to the Dharma, to a path that can get us permanently out of our suffering. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> permanently out of our suffering. <clears throat> to a place of deep inner peace, freedom, and ability to lead all others to that place. But just reflect for a moment, these positive circumstances as you inhale, breathe in that wave of appreciation, that gratitude to all the aspects of your body. Let it run through your blood. Go deeply into the bones and wash over every organ all the way down to a molecular level. and let it sift through all your mental activity, every thought, every feeling, touch with gratitude. Take a moment now to reflect on your positive qualities. Your positive qualities. This is harder for some people. You may think you have no positive qualities, but you have many. Just the fact that you showed up here today to gather some more information that helps free you. So just drink it in. And as you exhale, release anything that interferes. Release one of those objects to joy, obstacles to joy. And then take a moment to reflect, a little bit more somber note. The death is coming. We could die at any moment. So not to overly frighten us, but to consider how can I make the most meaning of today, of the rest of my day? That's what you'd want to be doing if you were actively dying, most probably. How can I make the most use of this time left? 
That's what I want to do. That's what I'm going to dedicate the day toward as much as I can. And just reflect for a moment on so many beings around the planet now are struggling. You can think of Ukraine and other war-torn places, violent places, even some people's homes are violent, living in that with your children every day. Thinking of the poor and the sick, the old, people with mental illness, people with physical illness. Just feel for a moment how fortunate I am, how amazingly fortunate. And just considering our motivation as much as possible, just think, is it possible for me to direct my awareness as much as I can throughout the day to doing activities, engaging in activities that will get me closer to enlightenment or closer to a situation where I'm unlimited in helping all these beings. If that's an idea that you like, feel free to include that in your motivation right now, taking a moment to set a positive motivation for our time together and all the activities of the rest of your day. So can you just imagine for a moment, imagine a situation in your life recently, if you can, a problem arose, something you'd label a problem with one other person, perhaps, something with your work, your apartment, your community, your housing, just your neighbors, family, perhaps. something you didn't like, something that interfered with your agenda. What was my view of this story? What was your mind telling you about the story and about the people involved? How often did you think about the problem later, over and over and over? Or were you able to quickly let it go, move on? Imagine you take a couple steps back from this problem. Is there any larger perspective you can see that offers a better way of working it out? Something more gentle, more harmonious, that you couldn't see right in the middle of it?
maybe just two steps back helps you to let go more. How best can you re reframe is a word we use in English, reframe. I'm giving myself a new look at this situation, a more positive look. I'm reframing, choosing to reframe with a more positive mindset. How would you do that with this problem? Is there a positive way to look at this? Is there a lesson, a valuable message you can take from this? And maybe messages for yourself as far as your own behavior. What I will say next time that's more gentle. How I will proceed next time that I'm in this situation or the next time I see this person. Something more positive, more harmonious. You can make that commitment in your mind right now. So please relax and slowly, when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So I just want to ask in the meditation, the brief meditation, does it help you to get less stuck in the situation? Anybody had trouble reframing? Finding a more positive approach? Capucine, you had trouble with the reframing? Or it was okay? Sorry, you were nodding in your head that you, it, Well, I'm half concentrating on the meditating and half on the uh, dealing with the uh, Zoom. So, uh, yeah. but uh, but yes, uh, when I was a bit uh, concentrated on it, uh, it worked a bit. It was difficult. Well, a bit because I was opening my eyes to for the chat and everything, you know. Uh, but uh, but uh, when uh, when I meditated, it worked. Uh, it worked a bit. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's so difficult, again, to find the, the, the example I gave yesterday of, of, this is a minor thing, was when my brother, when they took the old car away uh, that my brother's so attached to, I was just speaking with him last night about it, but then the view is, he said, oh, now I can see the garden. So again, that's a mundane problem, not a big problem, but there's always a way when you're having difficulties with people, um, you know, I'm just thinking, right now working with the center that I'm working with where sometimes it's quite difficult. And then part of my mind is this was Rinpoche's advice, which is really in my heart what I wanna do. And from following the advice before, I did see some pretty significant results for my mind. And um, so then that, you know, holding that guru in your heart in a sense 
um, keeps it there because I, I can re review now that I'm back in this room, just visiting, but remembering the pandemic year here, like two years I was here, um, how there was something when I went to sleep at night, especially the second year thinking, is this the best I can be doing? I'm, I'm kind of like, is there a center that needs help right now? I still have enough energy in me to do that. So wanting to step it up a little bit, wanting your practice, turning up the volume we say sometimes in, in the States. So you're investing yourself a little bit more in your practice and that doesn't mean it will be an easy ride. If you want an easy ride, you can find that. But for me, when I've had easy rides, which hasn't been a lot in my life, but <clears throat> excuse me, there, there's something when I go to sleep at night, I don't feel like I'm doing the maximum I could be doing. Okay. So another thing to think about, and many of you already do, because you've been practicing, I'm sure for a while, is regarding spiritual practice, regarding spiritual practice, um, this isn't the easy path. This is not an easy path. But again, look at life in general, spiritual or not, it's not necessarily an easy path. So there's even people, um, there's even people that you might think, well, you know, they have all this money and things must be, there's people I know with great wealth that, you know, have a child suffering from severe addiction or have an ill child, or there's strife in the relationship, or you never know with people. Right? But the thing is with the spiritual life, you have, you develop the tools to dismantle the problems in your mind. And then that automatically makes you happier and it doesn't matter what kind of conditions you have or living in. The mind is peaceful. So that's where we're headed. So it's something to think about that in general in the practice of bringing in more joy. Because I, for me, I find when I'm finding more meaning in life, and it's something I've mentioned this before in classes, finding more meaning in life is um, what are you, for me, this is how it works. What are you doing that helps others as much as possible? That gives my, my life personally great meaning. How best I can serve others. And we can do it in all different ways many, many different ways you can do it and multi ways in one life, in one life. But somehow that, like, even if it's difficult and even if there's nights I go home, you know, at the center thinking, why am I doing this? Like, this is too hard, but I know like I'm right where I need to be. It's a great feeling to, to know you're in sync with how you're supposed to be manifesting your life. And a lot, so find that meaning now, if you're not sure, and it's not about superficial happiness. It's about that deeper inner contentment. And for me, it's, it, it's all connected. It has to have some aspect of helping other beings. And the more I can do it, and the more I can get myself out of the way and all of what I need and what I want out of the way, um, I, I feel better and better. Now, it doesn't mean you neglect yourself on the way. You have to take care of yourself. So self-compassion is an important component, important part of helping me to help others. But really do think about that because that, that's a really deep sense of joy for myself that lends the joy. So let's go to the next pillar of, we started with perspective. <clears throat> the next one of, and these are the ones of the mind. We have four of the mind, four of the heart, Humility, and let me just refresh you on the eight pillars once again. Qualities of the mind, perspective, humility, humor, acceptance, we're looking at these right now. And then qualities of the heart, forgiveness, gratitude. We did a brief meditation involving gratitude earlier, compassion and generosity. Let's look at humility.
So the opposite in a sense of humility, arrogance, pride, similar words, arrogance or pride. We have another word in English, haughtiness. You know, thinking you're better than others. We know, we know, we understand what that means. Needing to feel bigger than others often comes from a terrible fear that we are smaller, comes from our insecurities, as we know. You know acting or feeling superior separates us from other people. So humility allows one to be approachable, to be connected like that. And so the interesting thing is humility, humor, which is the next one, and humanity all come from the same Latin root, humus, of the earth, of the earth, from the earth. So when we feel grounded, when we feel grounded and when we remember the grounding of the earth, and I like to also think of all that goes on on the earth, on this planet, helps me to experience more humility. You know, when I think about if I'm complaining about something in my life, right, then I think about the people in Ukraine, like on the planet with me of what other people are experiencing on the same earth that I'm living on the same planet. Sometimes I think about people in my own community struggling with poverty, violence. Right now I'm outside Philadelphia on the east coast of the states. Okay. This is actually um, where I'm from and the city of Philadelphia, I'm outside the city, just outside. But the city itself has struggled horribly, as you know, many of your cities, right, with the pandemic. And the worst part of our cities in the states especially during the pandemic, but always, is the public schools are terrible. The Philadelphia public schools are really horrible, most of them. So the children that were going to the schools when the schools shut down, the public schools, they didn't have, many of the kids did not have computers or devices to be able to get online teaching. So some of these kids lost about a year. And, and, you know, there was a philanthropist who offered $5 million to the Philadelphia schools to get every kid some way to get online, but some of the kids are homeless. So you can't shelter in place if you're homeless. There's no shelter for you, right? You can't get Wi-Fi if you're living on the street. So you might have a device what, what, you know, so, but also this person gave $5 million to the public schools for this purpose. Why didn't he give the $5 million before the pandemic? The schools needed it then as well. So they're living on the earth with me. It really humbles me like, wow, I have nothing to complain about. So think about that connector of humility from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Sometimes we confuse hum uh, humility with timidity, being shy, being shy, okay? It, it's not like that actually at all. You're not necessarily a shy, people, shy person because you're humble, okay? When he says, being a Christian, humility is the recognition that your gifts are from God, that your gifts are from God. And also, if you think of, and I've heard these quotes before, and this one is from Neem Karoli Baba, an incredible Hindu saint, contemporary, and I have some friends that he was their guru, Neem Karoli Baba. There's a beautiful book, an old book of, of the students put together, and it's similar to the book we have about Lama Yeshi, Big Love, which I would recommend you read, Big Love. It's a beautiful book, two volume book. But this one about Neem Karoli Baba, again, all his students wrote all the different interactions they had had with him and how extraordinary he was, right? And he said, see God in everything, everyone and everything. So again, if, if that's a way I'm honoring the divine in everyone, it brings me down to earth. We're the same, humility, like that. I'm not better than you. You know, I'm not criticizing you. I'm not competing with you. 
Humility allows us, Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, to celebrate the gifts of others. Okay? But it does not mean you have to deny your own gifts or shrink from using them. And this is from a Tibetan prayer. Whenever I see someone, may I never feel superior. From the depth of my heart, may I be able to really appreciate the other person in front of me. And, it, and it com it's funny, humility comes on the eight pillars of joy according to His Holiness and Archbishop Desmond Tutu right before humor, right before humor. So I wanna just play this brief video. I will share my screen. There's this, this delightful videos from some talks about the Book of Joy. Like the one I played yesterday was quite short. So now here, you, Tutu, my long time, my friend. Just let me know if you can't see something. So now here, you, Tutu, my long time, my friend. Uh, you see, uh, See, you have, I think, pot great potential. Potential, great potential, yes. I mean, great potential is to create more happier human humanity. <laughs> oh. Yes. Mm. So even, you see, just look, you see your face. I think many people, you're always laughing, always so joyful. That itself, very positive message. So sometimes, if may I say so, you see, leader, political leaders or spiritual leaders, very really serious face. But then, as soon as the story is then serious face, we feel yeah. <laughs> little, little. <laughs> so, oh, hesitant. Uh, hesitant. Oh, so, see, your face itself, you see, something. Uh, it's a big nose. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you sometimes you see your eyes. Oh, look, oh, big round. Oh, that sometimes scares me. <laughs> yes. So, so I really appreciate yes. you come and join our oh, sort of the, join sort of what's the work. So I, I do want to, I will find before we finish today, I just, I'll play a few of these, but I will try to find the one where Archbishop Desmond Tutu is teaching His Holiness to dance. Some of you may have seen that on YouTube. It's delightful. Very, very sweet. So let's look at humor. Again, coming from the same root word for humanity, earth and soil thing. And sometimes when you meditate, this is something that I find helpful when you meditate, is we think it's very serious meditation. And sometimes when I'm leading a retreat, I notice um, people, especially newer people, is we start the first session and I just glance around the room and I'll see some people caught, you know, the brow is knotted, the shoulders is up like, you know, they, it's very serious business. Actually, meditation comes from a very relaxed place. Your body mind relaxed as much as possible. And that's a component when we get on our cushion, when we get in our meditation position, okay? And you can absolutely meditate in a chair. 
You don't, you don't, if you can't sit cross-legged, you can sit in a chair. There's nothing wrong with that. Try not to lean too heavily against the back of the chair. Your back will become strong over time, but people forget the relaxation component. And many years ago, there was a Lama, some of you may have heard of, Reba Rinpoche. Um, he would teach at our centers. I was very close with him and he led us in this um, great tantric retreat once. And you know, we were all so excited and so nervous and kind of pushing in the sessions. And he, and he said, you know, if you don't disengage your nervous system as much as possible, you can't meditate well. And he said, and when you do, when you do disengage it, meditation comes organically. He said, it's, it's your natural state of mind, seriously. This is what contributes to joy. It's our natural state of mind. Okay? But we're not even in touch with it because we're so absorbed in our technology, distraction, you know, especially if you're living in a city even more so, all the activities of the city, all that went down in cities in the pandemic, people and ended up quarantined in very small spaces of their apartments they hadn't planned on. In Paris, um, I know I have a friend that lives in the ninth, um, that, you know, you had the, the, the permit of how long you could go out for one hour and walk around. It was very different than my experience of the pandemic here, where I could just go outside and walk. There's a woods right here. I could just go outside and walk whenever I wanted and be distanced from anybody like that. So, so all of these things create stress, as you know, and you lived through it. And um, what the stress does, and then we go, well, I should meditate. Uh, you know, if you're inside, great opportunity, especially those of you alone, but some people ended up in loneliness alone, not aloneness. Okay, aloneness is very different. I find a very powerful place. I was experiencing aloneness, which I do on retreat. I would, for me, it was like a mini retreat. So I just use that time. You can't go, you're not supposed to travel. We weren't, all the shops were closed. So go inward, use your mind and, you know, and, but for some people went into loneliness, it was scary. They didn't know if they'd get sick. They didn't want to get sick. Are the grocery stores, the markets going to close? That would have been alarming had we not been able to get food and things. So think about relaxing meditation. You sit on the chair, the cushion, the sofa, and spend a couple of minutes, go scan through the body top to bottom releasing the tension. As you inhale, you bring in space to the tension. Exhale, release the tension. It's a really important part of our meditation practice. And so another part of it is, have, if you're in a chair, have your feet flat on the floor or put them under a cushion if you need a little lift, but feel the grounding with the earth. If you're seated cross-legged on a cushion, feel the grounding of you on the seat even in your high, if it's a high rise apartment building, in your building, on the earth though, the earth is supporting all of us and feel the roots from the earth come up. They're not holding you in a heavy way. They're supporting you everywhere we go. So you have a problem that interferes with your joy. If you can't face it in the moment and feel the earth is there supporting me, you know, we feel as we get older, we feel more vulnerable. As we get weaker, we feel vulnerable. When we're sick, we may feel vulnerable. There's people on the planet that think that's a weakness, vulnerability. Okay. There's, and so we have a sociologist, some of you have heard of in the United States in Texas, Brené Brown. She's written some wonderful books about vulnerability, but also about being authentic being who you really are. And part of that is acknowledging our place on the earth, feeling the grounding with the earth when you, when you get kind of off balance, which we do because of problems and because of ignorance in our minds. So she says vulnerability is actually the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. And I actually view all three of those things as positive. So when you're vulnerable, you're realizing I may not be able to be the way I am right now. 
or to be able to do the things I was able to do. Something's shifted. So perspective, I can reframe like that. A friend of mine um, had surgery last year. Some of you may be aware and have had a similar thing. And they had to cut across his throat for an artery blockage. And when they did for a month after the surgery, it all went well, a month after the surgery, he had difficulty speaking. And he was terrified, absolutely terrified. And it is scary if you cannot speak again, right? So we were talking about it. And he was saying to me, he goes, you wouldn't be able to teach if that happened to you. And I thought about it, you know, because this is something I love and I, I'm doing more of it and a little less now with the center of responsibilities, but I'll be doing more in the future. And I really love it. And it's a lot of my joy. So I thought about that for a while. And then I thought, well, then I'll write. I'll do. So I, I was writing years ago, years and years ago. And I've, I've kind of not done it so much with the um, administratively running centers. I kind of got away from it. And I thought, well, then I'll just speak through words, you know, through the written word. There's always another way to look at it, another thing to look at it. But feel that grounding with the earth as much as you can. If you can't do it in the moment with your problem, if there's somebody in your face and it's too difficult, that's why I have my meditation practice. I go back and I'm going to do the work there. I'm going to rebalance my mind there. I'm going to figure out a reframing of how to better approach the problem, better approach the person in a generous, compassionate way, and myself uh, as well, and myself as well. And what I'll do is I'm going to rehearse practice. That's why we call it practice. Some people call it my meditation practice. Okay, It's a rehearsal for your mind. So I will rehearse that on my cushion again and again, better behavior, better thinking. You know, an, an ob obstacle with a difficult person, I'm going to put the person in front of me and I'm, I'm going to consider them in different ways I was unable to think about while I was in front of them. I'm going to think about their view, their motivation, their life. What's it like to look out through their eyes? Because when we're having an argument with someone, when we label somebody a problem, when we're blaming somebody for our unhappiness, you never consider, rarely consider their perspective. It's all about me. And that's the source of our suffering, is that self-cherishing. So on my cushion, I'm gonna do that work. Again, that meditation, analytically, analyzing, analyzing over and over. And then I'll actually think about new behavior to do with people like that with problems like that in my life, meaning I'm rehearsing and thinking about positive behavior. Maybe I was a little rude with my speech to the person. So I'm gonna rehearse now, even though they may be there and say the same things to me, I'm going to rehearse a more positive response on my cushion again and again, because when you practice it enough, okay, eventually it will become automatic. That's our practice. That's our spiritual practice. So it's, you've got your internal work on the cushion. Please try to have a meditation practice in your life. Learn how to meditate. Learn the effective techniques. And you start small with 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night. Then slowly extend the time. Sometimes you, you may just be sitting, letting those bubbles of irritated thoughts go if you're upset about something. But I find that just being still for a moment, quiet, let the bubbles sift off. Celebrate your positive qualities, reframe situations, feel the grounding with the earth, and then find your sense of humor. Find your sense of humor. Let's look at humor. Third pillar of joy. So I just want to check for a moment with Venerable Jimpa. The pace is okay. 
Okay. And everyone with what I was just saying, are we communicating? Does it make sense? So you may say, and I, I don't know the levels of your practice. I don't know how many years you've been going to Kala Chakra, the, to the center. I mean, I know Sanka, I know a few of you, but um, it's hard to get the meditation practice started if you haven't started it. We have an idea we wanna do it. You don't need any fancy altar. It's not about that. But the, having some stillness, we're, we're going to need a meditation practice more and more and more on the planet. It, it's such a beneficial cushion for you. So try to get it started now. Talk to the center. If they start opening and having meditation sessions or learn, get the book. I think it's translated into French, How to Meditate. Okay, Kathleen McDonald wrote the book, but it's Venerable Sange Kadro is her ordination name. She is one of our longest term nuns in our family. Venerable Sange Kadro. She wrote it a long time ago. It's been updated. I still use the book. It's really helpful. All kinds of meditations. Just go through the whole thing. Posture, try a meditation, do a meditation for two weeks. After two weeks, you won't need the book anymore. And that's how you'll build your repertoire. There it is in French. Thank you, Cap Capucine. You'll, you'll build your repertoire of meditations and you'll learn which meditations work for you in certain settings, which ones I need to do at this point. This is the one I need at this point. It's fantastic. And you try your best and ask friends, get help. Ask the center like that. That's what the centers are there for. Let's look at humor. Humor is a great one. Okay. Is it any surprise that we have a, a sense of humility? You have to have a sense of humility to be able to laugh at yourself. Okay. And to laugh at yourself reminds us of our shared humanity, this common humanity we have. And it's such a brilliant thing to be able to laugh at yourself. I find it in appropriate ways. And this is not getting down on yourself, but that sense of humor adds a lightness, adds a lightness to things. So helpful. I was just thinking recently, um, when we're doing these meetings, I have a board meeting later today for Land of Medicine Buddha. And in the beginning, it was very fraught, um, very um, tense. And the reason is the center's struggling significantly with money and mismanagement and things. And now it's better. You know, now we have the right people in certain places and a couple new managers coming that we're excited about. I spoke to one yesterday and, and I'm looking forward to working with him. And, and so what will happen is it, it, we have this tense vibe going around. And then occasionally somebody will interject humor at the right time. And I can see that like a lot of us have a sense of humor and then we'll joke and we'll laugh and then it's nice and we're friends, you know, but I could see that there's one person sometimes that wasn't kind of getting into this humor pattern. And I, I could just see how unhappy they seemed. And the rest of us are dealing with these problems and sharing ideas and trying to work it out and trying to help each other, which is what you want to do. And, and that humor just added a warmth of the heart really a warmth of the heart to have that sense of humor. So think about when you're able, when you can add, and especially laughing at myself, not taking myself too seriously in the, in the process. This is from a Joni Mitchell song. If those of you are familiar with the Canadian musician, Joni Mitchell, from her album, um, from, or from the song, People's Parties, Laughing and crying, she says, you know, it's the same release. Laughing and crying, sometimes they're so related like that. So again, if laughing and crying are so similar, if I'm able to laugh at myself, if I can find that joy from there, it also connects me to my humility that people are crying on the planet. I know that. It doesn't prevent me from laughing. It doesn't need to prevent you from laughing like that. I mean, the interesting thing for, for me noting is the situation in Ukraine, if you're familiar, I'm sure many of you are, the leader of Ukraine, Zelensky, was a comedian 
an actor in a sense, a kind of comic actor and, and did these shows that he was the leader of Ukraine. The whole thing is absurd to me when I think about who he really is. And so, and there was something where um, I just watched this video of him walking through Ukraine, Kyiv, with Boris Johnson, the leader of England, of UK right now. And, it, you know, it was amazing to just see them walking with guards, but, it, you know, the streets are deserted. The streets are deserted, but he's showing him, walking him around. And, and there was some little clip of them obviously talking. And it just seemed that there was a moment of some sort of lightness where even Zelensky kind of had a little bit of a smile on his face, or maybe he was telling a joke or so to, to find that for him in the midst of war, you know, I mean, he's certainly not joking when he's making his videos, but um, just keeping that lightness of heart in some of the gravest situations um, is possible to do. And sometimes you, you need to have that, okay? So what it goes against is, um, oh, wait, let me just find the, um, going against humor and things are going against um, frustration, anger. You know, when we experience fear and anger, we talked these, about these somewhat yesterday, fear and anger, fear puts us into a flight mode. I'm out of here. Get me out of here. Get me away from this person. Get me away from this. Anger puts you into a fight mode. So humor settles, you know, humor can, I can hang out. I can stay here and, and figure out, go, going back to my perspective, a reframing, more positive reframing in that, absolutely. Humor, as we know, breaks tension, as I said. It breaks down barriers between people. It brings people onto common ground. Again, there's the, there's the soil. There's our humility and of the earth brings people to common ground. It builds trust, community, communication. That's what humor is able to do. Okay. Now you have to have appropriate humor. You're not making fun of someone that is sensitive. You're not making fun of someone like that. So we recently, you know, we had these um, film award ceremonies, the Academy Awards they're called, they, they give out Oscars. Maybe you've heard of it. I didn't watch this ceremony. I find it quite boring, but I didn't watch the ceremony. But apparently, a friend of mine sent me a link. One of the actors that won a big award, one of the actors, maybe you, I don't know if you heard about this in the news. Um, <clears throat> his wife was, and, and what they do is that the people that host the show, the MC, we'll call them, they tell um, jokes. And some of the jokes are, poking fun at some of the actors. <clears throat> and they do it all the time. So if you can't laugh at yourself or have a sense of humor about yourself, some of the jokes are sensitive. They are, you know, they're kind of, you know, maybe not nice. So he told a joke about this big actor's wife who has a hair loss problem, apparently, right? And so she made a face at the joke. It wasn't, the joke was not really appropriate, but okay. But this actor got up and he punched, he slapped the, the host telling the joke in the middle of the ceremony. Like, you know, it's like, what is going on? Um, I don't know, did any of you hear this story? Was it the slap that went around the world or something? I mean, it was ridiculous, you know, it was, so I mean, I was, jo so I was joking with, um, but, but anyway, a friend sent me this link and if he could have just accepted the joke and I mean, kind of been like, okay, it's rude. It would have made the host kind of not look great because it was really not a great joke. But the fact to go up and assault someone was just so inappropriate like that, okay? But what happened, so then to carry this on a little bit. So the, there was somebody in our board meeting last week. We've had some little issues about should I use the word sexism? Okay, we, we are living in a patriarchy. Come on, you know. And what happens is there was a male board member 
that was accusing me of being rude in an email because I wrote a sentence that said, it would be really nice if we could be on time for the next meeting because we always start late. And then we all want to finish on time, but we have a lot of agenda items. I'm the chair of the board. They wanted me to be the chair. I didn't really want to, but I'm help I thought, all right, if it's helpful, I'll do that. So then I get accused of you were rude. And, and I read the email again and I said, well, I just mentioned, it. I said, well, how would, how would it be if I was a man saying that? And then a couple of them acknowledged that they've been really holding me to this separate thing where if a man was saying it, they wouldn't have any problem, right? So, um, you know, it's interesting how men can be strategic. I don't know what the word is in French and women are calculating a negative word like that. So this, is, this has been going on, as you know, for years. And um, so then I made a joke and we had a joke about adding emojis in your email, you know, the little symbols. And I didn't know how to do that. So then I, they said, oh, you should just add an emoji and then we know it's lighter. And I said, well, just imagine now that all of my emails have a little smiley face at the end of them. You know, so I was kind of, so we just made light of it and we're joking. But then I started joking with them and saying to them, well, you know, I'm from Philadelphia originally. And Philadelphia is, I'd have to say in the States, a kind of, I'm not sure the best word in French, but a gritty city. It, it's got, the people are a little bit hardcore. We are very direct. We are kind of in your face. And parts of Philadelphia people, you know, they just yell across the street to people. They're, they're, it's all, all of that goes. So I was joking with them about, we have an edge from Philadelphia. You know, you might find for instance, Asian cultures, they're much more reserved as a culture. My friend, my sister lives in England. When I visit in England, it's much more reserved culture than Philadelphia, like that. So then I said, you know, I'm from Philadelphia and make it a joke that this is how we are and, and left it. And then this, this movie award, the film award ceremony came on, this actor slapped. So I wrote to the board and I said, and guess where the, Will Smith is from? Guess where this actor is from? He's from Philadelphia, okay? So they, so just to make light of, you can always use humor, you can always bring humor in, um, in appropriate ways and find the lightness when you can. Again, to build this trust, to build, you know, when we start, when we have a tense attention in the meeting and I see that we'll, somebody will have a joke and it breaks the tension and suddenly we're like, we can do this. We can do this, absolutely. And then there's a, this is a funny quote from laugh and the world laughs with you. Snore and you sleep alone. Okay, let me bring another, here's another um, of His Holiness a video. That I wanted to share with you. I never consider myself as a son. If I never consider myself as a something special. If I consider myself uh, something different from you, like I'm Buddhist. Uh, even more, I'm His Holiness Dalai Lama. Uh, or even if you consider I'm Nobel Laureate. Then, actually, you create yourself as a prisoner. I forget these things. I simply consider I'm one of the seven billion human beings. We are mentally, emotionally, intellectually, we are same. When, when in aeroplane, 
Sometimes this gas problem comes. Then, you see, difficult to let out. No? So occasionally, you see, look around. Then, then you know, like, <laughs> make some kind of pledge. Now on, I must make a new person. Same body, but new person. I have to thank you so much. I have learned much from meeting you today. I have learned, for, for instance, that we are all on the same road. Yes. With the ultimate goal, yes, right. that we're all different travelers. Have and also seen? same experience of gas. <laughs> so for someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama to joke, like that um it brings well, you the right. Dalai Lama is back in Australia you... and despite the very bad joke that I told him last time well it brings you right back to earth that we're all on this earth we're all the same um incredible so it's so touching with humility so broadening your perspective on things you know that we all have gas in a sense you know just but also the fact that he's just so humble to be able to be like everyone else talking about it you know so openly and just so helpful. Humor again, it's about humility. Laugh at yourself. Try not to be so pompous, so serious. It makes everything easier, okay? Including your ability to accept others and accept all that life will bring. So acceptance is the next pillar of joy. Um, it's the last one of the pillars of the mind, acceptance. This is a huge one. And I also wanted to just orient um, our timing today is because yesterday I had a session I had to lead. So we cut the morning by a half an hour. So this is a, this is a two hour session. And um, I just wanted to check in with everyone if we're, we need it, if people would like to take a break. Do you normally take a break in the two hours? How do people feel, five minute break or should we just continue on? Any strong feelings about that? Arno or Venerable Jimpa, do you normally want a break in the two hours for, and you're also for the interpretation? We no, usually fine. don't, but yeah, let's check with Venerable that's, Jimpa. Okay. That's fine for me, yeah, it, it goes smoothly. That's very- uh, You're fine, okay, so let's yes, continue on. And then the afternoon, the next session later, it's your afternoon now, but the, then we take a break and then the next session will be, I think is an hour and a half. Yes. Yes, okay, so I just wanted to, to confirm with everybody that we'll go, we will have the two hours this morning. And just making sure that you are okay to keep going whenever. Yes, I'm fine. I'm fine. No problem Thank at all. You. Acceptance, I tend to combine with the first pillar of the heart, forgiveness. But I'm going to talk about acceptance right now. Um, sometimes I do courses more focused on acceptance and forgiveness, acceptance. And think about this. I just think about something I think about a lot actually is um, in life is when are you not accepting? When are you not accepting life the way it is? When are, be, because we're unable, many of us don't have a um, direct perception of emptiness because you don't have a direct experience of the nature of reality. And so because of that, we're always seeing a mistaken situation. And I use the English word, we have a misknowing, K-N-O-W. I'm not sure how the word's translated in French, but a misknowing of every, our entire reality, ourselves, everything we experience. We misunderstand it based on fundamental ignorance. So it's not that you're a problem. I'm not laying a criticism on you or myself. This is just how it is with an unenlightened consciousness that doesn't have a direct perception of emptiness. And what we're called is ordinary beings or sentient beings. Sentient being indicates you don't have a direct 
perception of emptiness. Sentient means with a consciousness, but it's a contaminated consciousness. Okay. So again, I'm not, oh, I don't mean to overly criticize. I'm just talking about reality. Talk about myself. I have a contaminated consciousness because I don't have the direct perception yet. When you have that perception, you become what's called an aria being, a noble being. Aria being like that. But so as ordinary beings, we suffer from this fundamental ignorance. And people say, well, where did it come from? When did it start? The ignorance in my mind. There's no beginning to it, Buddhism says, because the mind has no beginning. Your consciousness has no beginning because of the law of karma. Whatever first moment you think there is, there will be a, Buddhism says there's a cause preceding that moment that caused it. And there will always be a preceding cause. The ignorance is simply there because there's a preceding moment of that in the mind. And there's a moment before of that in the mind. I haven't been able to undo it yet, you might say. So that creates a familiarity with ignorance in the mind. As a result, it causes us to see things in a certain way, in a mistaken way. And then what happens is our, our, the ignorance causes us to want things to be a different way. So we're not accepting the way it is. We're not accepting the way it is. Some of you may know people who have lost a leg or an arm or something like that, unfortunately, due to disease or an accident. Some people may know people, and I knew in the, in the pandemic, the people I know that did really well, and I'm sure you would say the same thing where you were living, the people who did very well in the pandemic were able to adapt. The people I know that didn't do well had trouble adapting. They wanted everything to be the same. So there were a lot of people that were calling me and emailing that needed support, emotional support. And I would talk with them through the years, through the couple of years, over and over. And, and I could tell they were still like, well, the place I used to get my breakfast is not open. You know, I don't know when it's going to open. Like all this focus on one narrow view of this store, this store is closed, this store went out of business, or I can't go out. I can't go out. Well, then figure out if you can't go out. There's someone I know who they're, they're old and feeble, and then their elevator was unrepaired for five months in their New York apartment building. So they were literally bound to like a one-room apartment for months and afraid to go out because of the pandemic. As you had also in France, it was very, um, you were very locked down like that. So again, then I'm in my one room. What am I going to do? I have to deal with it. So you figure something else out and adapt. So you can think about acceptance. We, we often refuse to accept our circumstances like this. Nelson Mandela, who went to prison for, I think, 30 some years, right? And talks about, and you can read some of his books of how angry he was as an activist being sent to prison for basically political crime for really nothing just for having a different view under the apartheid regime and went to prison with tremendous anger and fortunately adapting to being in this one room cell, you can actually visit, if you visit the Republic of South Africa and go to Cape Town and you take a ferry over to this island, Robben Island, and you can visit his cell where he was held prisoner for years, <clears throat> um, said that it, it he, it transformed him where he was able to realize the anger is not gonna fuel the movement that he's interested in. It's not gonna heal people. It's not gonna help his country people. So that transformation of accepting the situation and then finding new ways, again, the reframing, the gaining the bigger perspective. What's the best way to use my life? You can sit there and stew in anger for the rest of your life. And, and that alienates you from other people, as you know. So acceptance. <clears throat> Look at what we're not, what you're not accepting, what we are accepting. From Archbishop Desmond Tutu, he says, we're meant to live in joy. This doesn't mean that life will be easy or painless. It means that we can turn our faces to the wind and accept that this is the storm we must pass through. So when you accept that, 
move through the difficult situation, you'll find the joy there, have you moved through it? You know, even my mentioning about the center where I currently am and seeing the difficulties, I've been through this two times before with two other residential centers in the States. They both had somewhat similar situations. <clears throat> Maybe not quite as bad as this situation. There was no pandemic, but two other times and all I can do is face what's going on and use whatever skills I have, which are limited and work as best as I can with these wonderful people who are so dedicated. They really they have such good hearts, these people. You know, I can't say anything bad about them. They're just, they just keep showing up, you know? So again, like I can turn into that rough wind and kind of say, well, you know, so I kind of sometimes go, this is a challenge, like the other two centers. And we made those other two centers shining. Those other two centers are amazing now. It, it, it's amazing to see. So, so it's like this place actually, in my view, has the biggest potential of almost any of the centers where I've taught in the FPMT. So it's going to have big obstacles. Usually a big obstacle is the greater the potential. So sometimes I get really excited and I'm like, this place is amazing. What it could possibly be. It's incredible. Okay. It, accepting, you know, turn into the wind. Life is not going to, life in samsara is not going to be an easy ride. <clears throat> Stress and anxiety come from our expectations of how life should be. Think about that. I'm not accepting what is. That's where your stress and anxiety comes in. I need it to be different. I need the shop to be open. I need the pandemic to be over. People said to me, when do you think it's going to be over? Like I'm some omniscient being. I have no idea. But I already, right now, the US went all the way down, are really looking good. Now we're starting to go back up and it's going to go way back up again. I can just see it. There's some variant on the variant now of Omicron. So I, the numbers are, now fortunately, the good part is the deaths are going down and that's remaining down. They're not going up. That's been significant. So again, people get sick, but people get the flu, people get colds, people get other things. And they fortunately end up not dying from them. So hopefully you don't end up with a long COVID situation of a heart issue. And there are some things like that. But people, um, but the numbers are going to go up. We may just learn to live with this on the planet. Okay? Can you accept that? What do you not accept about your life right now? Do something really helpful. What might shift some things for you? What I'd like to do, if it's okay, is I'd like to go to breakout rooms. <clears throat> so those of you with your cameras off, I, I just need to make sure you're okay to participate in the breakout rooms because some, somebody might be left alone. And what I'm going to do is there's, I'm going to break you into groups of three, 10 minutes. So think about your timing when you're in a breakout group. Is everybody okay with this? Usually people like it. They meet other people and they, okay, we'll try. I'd like you to talk about acceptance. <clears throat> What are you not accepting in your life? I know there's a little bit of revealing, but feel free to also talk about the other pillars we've discussed, but really focusing a little bit more on acceptance right now. Think about if you have three people in your group, that's about three minutes each to speak. So please make sure you're actively listening as well. It's not just about me expressing myself, but can you help each other with a little bit more acceptance. These are some things I'm really struggling with that I need more perspective on. So 10 minutes to discuss a little bit or anything you've learned a little bit from the pillars we've gone through that you could bring a little bit more of that into your life. Does that sound okay? I'd love to hear some insights, some responses. <clears throat> the only thing we've heard about is we might have people from different languages I don't okay. know. That uh, is very true. You might have to create. How many, I'm just wondering how many of you speak French? Can you put your hand up? Okay, so far it looks like 
everybody that I can see speaks French. Okay, good. Okay, and 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 I have Mouchlach. I'm not sure if you. Cislan is speaking French. Yeah, she is. Okay, okay. So we're gonna try that. Bonjour à tous. Okay, great, wonderful. So just bear with me while I assign. So I don't know how to leave like Jimpa out. So I think we're all gonna end up in a group like that. So I hope that's okay. I'm the one who may have trouble understanding. <clears throat> So, uh, Venerable Amy, we have uh, one person we cannot talk because the person is not alone at home. Okay. And actually, two, two of them, actually, uh, Gislaine Mouchlac, Mouchlac and also Dominique Watalo. Both of them uh, okay. can participate. So I'm not sure how to take her out of that room. Okay, well, there'll just be two in that group because I put her in a room and I, I don't know how to take her out. Okay. This is a third person as well. The, the name is Y, <laughs> just the letter Y. Okay. Okay, I think I've got it. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just um, see if I can add somebody to that group. <clears throat> okay, 10 minutes, I will send you a reminder when you have about a minute left. <clears throat> <clears throat> 